If you would, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter two. I want to share with you a message we entitled Good News of Great Joy. Man, it's good news. It's good news to be alive today. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. I got good news for you today. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Luke chapter two, I'm going to start in verse eight. If you just follow along with me. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Hallelujah, Lord. We're so thankful. Lord, we re rejoice in the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ has come and he's reconciled man to you. Lord, we thank you that we have peace with you. God bless you, Lord God. May you uh, continue to reveal your truth in Jesus name. Amen. I like that line in verse 10. Good news of great joy for all the people. Hey, that's what the church should be all about. Good news of great joy. We have a message of good news and it is for everyone. You know, then the, the Bible says the angels, it's like the sky opened up. If you can picture it, that angel comes and a, appears to these shepherds out in the field. And there they were. And it's just amazing how God chose to send the Savior in a little town of Bethlehem and chose to first reveal it uh, to shepherds out in the field. But then as they looked up, they saw the sky split open. They saw all of the hosts of heaven and the hosts were making a proclamation, glory to God and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. You know, I want to talk about this verse, analyze it a little bit, look at the good news, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to understand the good news and what he was talking about when he said, peace to to men. I want to compare this good news of what he's saying, the new covenant grace that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who had been proclaimed and the one the prophets spoke about who was coming. Now the angels are saying he's here. The savior has been born and you're going to find him in the manger. Go and see. And that message started to spread from that day all over the world. I'm glad it's reached us here in Winsboro, Louisiana. Amen. I'm glad, just like Jesus said, it's being proclaimed in nations and people groups all over. It is spreading and truly it is good news of great joy for all the people. Now, compare this a little bit, this New Testament good news of great joy when he says peace to men. OK. Compare this to, to what it seemed like in the old covenant when there was enmity between God and man. 
There was a division between God's holiness and man's sinfulness. And the wrath of God was upon the sin of mankind. And there had to be judgment, praise God, for all the sin that was committed. And there was a separation between sinful man and holy God. What these angels are proclaiming is now is the time when there is going to be peace between God and man. In other words, they're saying the war is over. The war with sin and the wrath of God and judgment upon that sin is now over. And there's good news because of this child that's born. He's going to usher in the new covenant of God's grace. So there has to be a comparison, a contrast between old covenant law and judgment and new covenant grace. And here's the time. It's because of this baby being born. It's because Christ's coming to save us from our sin, to do away with it and to usher in peace between God and man. Hold your spot there and flip back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 19. Now, we know before God chose out Abraham and set aside Abraham and his physical sons and daughters, the tribes became God's holy people that he watched over and protected and gave victory in this earth. Before that, we know that the wrath of God had to judge the sin for we see it also in the book of Genesis at the time of the flood. We see that mankind's sinfulness had corrupted the earth to the point where holy God had to judge the sin and it was wiped out with that flood. And then we see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now we see God separating them from the rest of the world, his hand and protection upon them. But we also see that the sinfulness of man was still in them and there was still a separation. I want y'all to think about that and understand this concept we want to get across today between old covenant and new when Christ was being proclaimed to finish the work. Amen. What well, we need to understand this so we can understand our role as a new covenant church today in Exodus chapter 19. The story goes, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were in bondage for 400 years, were being brought out and they were entering, going to enter into the promised land. But before they could go in, they had to stop and meet with God. And they had to meet with God on Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, they were going to receive the law, the covenant God was making at that time with mankind. Praise the Lord with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But let's look a little bit, starting in verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready on the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Hmm. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Don't even touch that one. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horde sounds a long blast, may they go up to the mountain. So here they're about to go and meet the God who delivered them out of Egypt. They saw his power. They saw the plagues that came on the Egyptians that would uh, allow them to get out of there and go as God delivered them from that bondage. But now they were going to go to the mountain and God was going to speak to the one on their behalf, the mediator between them and God, Moses, who is going to bring down God's law. But as they approached the mountain, God said, don't don't tell them not to get too close. Don't let them come too close to the mountain, come to the foot of it. And if anyone does, he's going to stone him or shoot him with arrows. Don't touch him because it, you'll die too. 
But you can you can you're going to see the awesomeness of God. You're going to hear the earthquake. You're going to see the fire. The mountain's going to tremble and you're going to come near it. But don't get too close. Why? Because there was a separation in the relationship between holy God and sinful man. Man's nature had been corrupted by that sin. And there was a separation there where man couldn't approach too close to God because of God's holiness. Not because God's mean, not because God's angry, because God's holiness sin couldn't mix. God is a holy and just God. They couldn't even get too close to the mountain. They were afraid to watch what happened next. In the old covenant. The Bible says in verse 14, after had Moses had gone to the mountain to the people and consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourself on the third day, abstain from relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke. It was because the Lord descended on it. The smoke billowed up like a smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Well, just picture this scene. This is, this is real. This happened. God, the creator who created you, who created all the beauty around us and the mountains and the streams and the rivers. God was going to meet with a certain group of people that he had called out of the world to show his holiness, to show himself. And his plan was to eventually cause the world to understand that we needed a savior. This savior that the angels were proclaiming had come to the world to make right the relationship between God and man. But at that time in the old covenant, the relationship was not right between God and man. Man was at enmity, enemy of God because of sin. And God was gradually over 4000 years bringing us to the point where we recognize we need the savior and we're calling out from our heart, desiring to be right with God, but it's only in the savor that we could. So you can see the good news that the angels were proclaiming. Hey, I'm bringing good news of great joy for all the nations, for all the people. And the good news, praise God, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, there is now, because of this one that's being born, there's going to be peace between God and man. You understand what they were proclaiming? Let's watch a little bit farther. Praise the Lord. In chapter 20, we know that they re Moses received the Ten Commandments. And praise God in verse 18, after the Ten Commandments were listed, it says, when the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Think about it. Let that sink in the picture of the only people group on earth that had been called out by God to start having a relationship with him. And yet they can't get too close to him because of their sin inside and holy God. It was an awesome thing what they saw. Bible says they trembled with fear. That's the mountain trembled. It shook the lightning, the thunder and the people trembled. And they finally, hey, Moses, don't do that again. Don't bring us to the point where we hear God's voice. It'll kill us all. We are, we are, we are too corrupt. We, we can't, we can't come close. That God is so holy. He's scaring us he, with fear. We're shaken. We're trembling at his voice. Moses, you go talk to him and you come tell us what he said, but don't let him speak again to us. It was a fearful thing because God's holiness and man's sinfulness. Now, praise the Lord. Goes on to say in chapter 20, Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Although 
They were very much so. He's saying this is going to work out God's goodness in the future. He's doing this for a reason and this needs to happen. But he says this. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. Now, when they sinned, they were commanded to die for their sin. And they were shown that. And they said, oh, we want the fear of God to be in you. Do you see how awesome God is? And that fear of God is going to keep you from messing up too much because you've seen how awesome he is and you've seen how sinful you are and you see the results of sin in the camp when we're commanded to stone the people and this is gonna produce in you like someone afraid to go back to jail or the law is on you to the point where you don't wanna get caught because you're afraid of the punishment that's gonna come. You understand? That was the, so the purpose of that, that law and that fear of God because God's wrath for the sin had been poured out and was continuing because judgment had to come where there was sin because God is a just and holy judge. Now, I told you this was good news of great joy. But you've got to understand this part in contrast and compare the old covenant. Now, go with me all the way to the back of the book to Hebrews chapter 12. Almost to the book of Revelation. Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to start in verse 18. Now, the writer is comparing this very story with the new covenant grace of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched or is that that is burning with fire. You've not come to darkness, gloom and storm. You've not come to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. Do you see the writer of Hebrews is talking to this about this exact story in Exodus 19 and 20. We just read. He said, you've not come to that Mount Sinai again because verse 20 says, because they would could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. This is about the new covenant. That was the old when they saw the fear. And now they're saying you're coming to something much greater. You're coming to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jer Jerusalem. You're coming to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Those same angels that the shepherds saw say in glory to God in the highest. Man, that's what we have come to now. We've come to thousands of thousands. We've come to Mount Zion. Verse 23, we've come to the church of the firstborn. We've come not through Moses to a trembling mountain. We've come to the church of the firstborn. We have come to those whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. We haven't come to Moses to mediate between a fearful God and a sinful nation. We've come to Jesus, Jesus, the mediator between God and man who took away all man's sin, who made us right with God by his blood. Hallelujah. We've come to the mediator once and for all to Jesus Christ. It's a different story. It's a new covenant. It's in comparing and contrast. We have to understand it's a better covenant. It's a new covenant. And the angels were proclaiming glory to God. And now on earth, there's going to be peace between man and God because of this child born. He's the official. He's the mediator between God and man where he doesn't just scare the people because of their sin. He did away with the sin once and for all. Hallelujah. Now, praise the Lord. It goes on to tell us. Amen. You have come to God, the judge of all men, 
to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Everybody say a better word. The blood of Abel cried out for vengeance on Cain. The blood of Jesus cries out for mercy for you. Amen. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus washed away. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. He's calling out with his mercy and grace to all. Now, watch this. This is very interesting in relating the understanding between the fear of God in the old covenant and the love of God and worship of him in the new. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, and we're going to look at verse 13. This is something I'd like all the Christians, hallelujah, right here in the river of life, to understand and make a note of this verse and another one I'm about to show you in your Bible that you might point it out to other people. So they, they might understand this message as well. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13 says this. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only. Do not follow other gods or the people around you, okay? But fear the Lord and serve him only. Now, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Mark that spot down in Deuteronomy 6, 13, circle it, and make a note next to it, Matthew chapter 4. Let's compare that verse given in the Old Covenant about the fear of God that would come on the people to try to keep them from sinning because they were afraid of the judgment. Everybody following me? Okay. You know, as I said before, that can work for just a little while. But the fear of punishment doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. The judgment of God, the law of God, the punishment of God doesn't bring, around, bring about his will to make us righteous before him. All it is is the school teacher teaching us our need to be saved from ourself. The fear of jail didn't keep you out of it. Amen. It's only a change from within that will produce the desired results for your future. Amen. Hallelujah. So in this, we see the Bible quoted in Deuteronomy 6, and we say it a lot of times in churches all around, fear God, fear God. The fear, we, we quote the old covenant, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But what did Jesus say about how to interpret this verse? Well, let's look at it. He used this very verse when he was defeating the enemy who's still out there. Chapter, Hebrew, uh, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was led out into the wilderness to be tempted of the enemy to overcome and defeat him. Verse 8 says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And the devil said, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. How did Jesus defeat him? With the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter six. And he said, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But Lord, did you mess up? The verse you were quoting in Deuteronomy says, fear the Lord and serve him only. Why did you say worship the Lord and serve him only? Let's learn something today. New Testament interpretation of Old Testament fear the Lord is worship the Lord. God doesn't want us to fear him. He wants us to come boldly to the throne of grace, jump in his lap and worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus' new covenant interpretation of fear the Lord is worship the Lord. He quoted it himself, and many times as he's quoting the Old Testament, 
He gives the new covenant interpretation of what the old covenant was really talking about and what it means to fear the Lord. Today, what it means to fear the Lord is to understand him and reverently believe in what he's done so much so that we give our life to Jesus, receive him as our savior, and we receive the message that the angels proclaimed and we become right with God. And now there's peace between God and man so we can jump in his lap and not be afraid, but go to him with anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But today we're having to reteach this to pastors and leaders all over the world because the church has been sidetracked to think that God is schizophrenic, that he was one. He's in the Old Testament here in the New Testament. And which way is it? Should we be afraid of God or should we love him and jump in his lap? What is it? Is he going to condemn us for our sin and kill us or is he going to love us by the blood? Which is it? We need to understand church so we can get the message right. I've got for you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to man on whom his favor rests because he's not angry at any of the sin anymore. As a matter of fact, sin is not the problem. Jesus did away with it. Some misinterpret that verse and think it says peace to the world. Peace among men. Man. 2,000 years ago, as Jesus hung on the cross, if he did that to bring peace among men to the nations, looks like he failed. There's not peace among nations now. There's war and rumors of war. There will be peace when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords returns to this earth. But right now he's come to bring peace between man and God. And when, when we have that peace, there can be peace among us. There's peace among the brothers. There's peace among the body of Christ. There's peace among the church. I go to different nations, hallelujah. And if they've received Christ and have the spirit of the Lord and follow him, then we are one in Christ. And there's a lot of peace between us because we've been reconciled to God. So we're reconciled to each other. But for those who haven't received Christ yet, there is war, there is pain, there is suffering. There's all kinds of things. See, Jesus said himself, I haven't come to bring peace. Did he not? We think we interpret that verse that would say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to the world on all the nations. No, the war is over between God and the sinfulness of man. And he's come to reconcile man to God. But Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace on this earth right now, but division. Because of this message, because of this truth, some are going to receive it and have peace with God and others are still under the influence of the enemy. But God wants to go us to go tell them the good news. God's not angry with you and not judging you for your sin because the Savior has come and God judged him from your sin. Turn and receive this good news. Hallelujah. This teaching seems radical to a lot of religious folks. It's simply the pure message of the gospel, but it's radical in the way it's being taught because so many are still under the influence and don't understand the difference between old covenant law and wrath and new covenant grace and mercy. Hallelujah. We've got to get this message right. Do you see what the angels have proclaimed? It's kind of like this. Let me tell you a story. I'm repeating a story that Andrew Womack, one of our mentors, praise the Lord, says so good in his book, The War is Over. Hallelujah. I hope you took a note of that verse. Jesus in Matthew 4, quoting Deuteronomy 6 and how he interpreted it New Covenant way. It's not something so shocking. The old covenant says thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus said, you've heard it said this. Well, let me tell you what it really means. The old covenant says thou shalt not kill. Well, let me tell you a deeper truth. I don't even want you holding anger against one another. He took it to the next step. So he takes this to the next step. Fear God. No, worship him. Love him with your whole life. That's what it means now. Amen. Y'all okay? 
story goes, in the days of the mafia, in some cities, New York, Chicago, someone would come to a business owner, old Guido, and say, hey, I know there's been some arson around here, lots of fires burning down businesses and people getting hurt, but I want to protect you from that. You give me some money, you know, once a week I'll come around here and you give me some money, pay me off and for, for protection, and, you know, we'll see to it that your business don't burn. Well, everybody kind of figured out that it was Guido's crew that was burning the businesses. So he was doing the tough stuff there. And then offering to protect. Well, some in religion, we teach people that God is like that. That God is angry with you. That he's judging you. That this sickness that came on your family is God's wrath and judgment on you. That this trial you're going through with your addiction is because God's mad at you and he's punishing you. But if you come to church enough and pay your tithes and do what we tell you, then we'll hold God off of you for a while. If the pastors in the denomination say, hey, you keep all of these rules and regulations of the law and our denomination and you do well enough, then, you know, we'll intercede for you and pray, you know, God's wrath is out there and God's getting everybody and you better come and walk close with us or God's going to get you. That's a lot of what religion teaches. That God's the one doing the wrong to you, judging you like that. And if you do enough for him, then maybe he'll hold off on his judgment. Huh. Let me clear that up real quick. Jesus Christ paid for all of the sin of everybody once and for all, the judgment of God, which was righteous, which is holy, which needed to be done, it did fall, but it fell on his own son. Hallelujah. And he took it all in. Now, the good news is God is not judging you. Some, some have trouble with this. I'm a, I must let it sink in a minute. Churches used to preach... Man, God's about to judge America. God's going to judge your family because you're not doing, America's not doing a good enough, so God's going to judge America. God's going to judge your family, your town, uh, the, the political things going wrong. This, these wars going on in other nations, it's because they're evil and God's judging them. Man, if God doesn't judge that nation for its wickedness, man, then he's going to have to apologize for Sodom and Gomorrah because he judged them. Let me give you a different idea, a new covenant version of what you used to think. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests, not his judgment, because of this child Jesus. No, if God judges America for our, us as a nation moving away from him, He's going to have to apologize to Jesus. Because Jesus paid for the sin already. And God is a holy, righteous judge, and he's not going to judge sin for the same thing that's already been paid for. That's double jeopardy. He won't do it. It's been paid for. Now, there is a judgment coming and a day of wrath coming, but we are not in it right now. We're in the time of grace and mercy where the church has risen up, praise the Lord, to proclaim good news of great joy for all people that God has reconciled mankind to himself through Jesus Christ. What they need to do is receive it and believe the message, hallelujah, that they can step into that right relationship with God. And one day, praise the Lord, those who have rejected it will receive the wrath because they didn't take the payment. It's like somebody, you know, took your payment and was going to do 20 years for you and came to tell you about it and wrote you about it and sent people to tell you and offered it to you and say, hey, you're pay it's been paid, it's been paid. Say, sorry, man, I don't believe all that. I'm going to jail myself. I'm going to go do my time in hell. 
I don't want what Jesus did for me. Man, we can't help if you don't, if you reject the good news, we just got to go tell everybody the good news. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to all mankind because Jesus paid it all. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to close. 2 Corinthians 5. Watch this. Verse 18. All this good news I'm telling you is from God. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the church, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Now hear this. Many people read over their Bible and don't think about it and study what it's saying. So let's stop and do that now. That God, verse 19, was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Not imputing men's sins against them. God is not in this dispensation of his new covenant grace counting men's sins against them. Well, then why is there so much trouble? Because you're walking in the error of your own ways and nations are walking in the error of their own ways. And there's a devil out there stealing, killing and destroying their life. God's attitude is come to me. I want to bless you. If you're if nations and people and governments are walking out here and they're getting cut up and bombed and hurt and all kind of things, it's not God's wrath or God's judgment because the Bible says in the new covenant. He's not even counting men's sins against them. Amen. This is radical grace, man. This is as radical as Paul preached it. Paul's my buddy. He knows me and I know him, even though we never really physically met. I listen to him as he speaks through the Holy Spirit to me all the time. And I love his teaching and his writing. He teaches it just like Jesus. He rebuked the religious and reached out to the sinner. And praise God, I'm telling you, under new covenant grace, God is not counting man's sin against him. Hey, some of you that's been falling and struggling with things, receive the good news of great joy. What do I do then? Be thankful. Turn that fear of God into reverent worship Lord, I'm thankful out of love of what you did. I'm coming back close to you because I can. I don't have to be afraid of coming back to the church. I don't have to be afraid of following you. I'm not coming to a mountain trembling with fear. I'm coming to the blood of Jesus Christ, to the throne of grace. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. For unto us a child is born, a Savior is given, Christ the Lord. Of the increase of his government and peace shall be no end. This peace of God between God and man, we have been given the role to reconcile the world back to God through the message, the good news of God's grace. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I believe that through the word of truth, these people today and those who will be listening to it in different nations in the name of Jesus will come closer to you by the truth that's setting them free. 